world would be a worse place without it. With more violent criminals, fraudsters, and murderers. It's just fascinating to think that you might use the tiniest bits of evidence in order to solve a, a puzzle. Criminals were able to evade justice for centuries, but investigators can draw on powerful new tools. New techniques, unconventional ideas and brilliant minds have made sure that criminals are identified and crimes are proven and solved. Anyone who perpetrates a crime today would have to contend with an army of experts who continue to advance a fantastic invention. All of this means that, you know, we're making the world uh, not only just a safer place, but hopefully a more just place. Nowadays, scientists and investigators use state-of-the-art means to convict criminals. They examine even the most minute details to track them down. But in times past, some of the methods used to prove a crime were worse than the crime itself. So for centuries, the gold standard of proof in any kind of criminal trial was the willingness of the accused simply to confess that they'd done it. And that meant that in lots of places, for a lot of time, torture was a normal part of criminal proceedings. And great lengths are gone to to torture the alleged truth out of people. Flogging stretching on a rack, or torture on the Judas cradle, are common methods all over the world. Human cruelty knows no limits. Rat torture is, is horrific. It involves placing a rat inside a half cage um, on top of a restrained person's abdomen. Then the cage is heated, so obviously the rat, desperate to escape, begins to burrow through the only soft surface it can find, which is a person's flesh. Um, the pain is excruciating. You know, it's the stuff of nightmares. But how credible are confessions extracted through torture? Do they really serve to find the truth? They would just hurt someone so grievously that the person started to talk. Whatever you want me to say, just make the pain stop. They could have known better even back then that people will say what the torturer wants to hear. It's so obvious. Torture still goes on today. Waterboarding, for example. One might have expected that this practice was a thing of the past. In the 1980s, the United Nations adopted an anti-torture convention that was ratified by over 150 nations. Torture is still a widespread phenomenon. A couple of years ago, Amnesty International surveyed the extent of torture across the globe and reported cases of torture in over 120 countries from every region of the world. Torture, also branding, which was practiced for a time, is an unthinkable and unreliable method of uncovering the truth. Criminologists have to find better ways of exposing lies. But how should they go about it? In the early 20th century, it looked like a breakthrough was on the horizon. The Italian experimental psychologist Vittorio Benussi is convinced that liars are betrayed by nervousness. Benussi constructed an apparatus to measure the physical reactions of nervousness, the polygraph. It later evolves into the famous lie detector. Did you steal that watch from the post exchange? No. The polygraph doesn't measure lies. It measures sweat, respiration, blood pressure, 
and pulse. Based on spikes on a polygraph chart, experts hope to distinguish lies from the truth. Lie detectors are often used, um, you know, by organizations like the FBI or CIA. In fact, sometimes they're used just as a threat, right? Just the thought that this device could work makes people more likely to confess in some cases. In fact, even companies use lie detectors in interviews. But the use of lie detectors is controversial. Certain signs give away an individual's nervousness, yet the detectors can't necessarily determine why this person is nervous. In some countries, such as Germany and Austria, these devices may be used in principle. The results, however, cannot be used as evidence in court. Scientific studies on the effectiveness of lie detectors are highly controversial, partly because lie detectors have been outwitted again and again. So lie detectors are certainly not a definitive breakthrough in the search for the truth. The thought is tempting. A machine that definitively shows whether someone is lying or not. But there is no such thing. We need better methods to convict criminals. What can criminologists do to keep one step ahead of criminals? Crime witnesses are unreliable sources, especially when the alleged perpetrator can't be properly identified. For this reason, some police stations started to keep records on criminals by the early 19th century, but these are often useless. If you were somebody who had been arrested, you had been photographed, and you knew that photograph was going to be shown to witnesses or even to the victim of your crime, and so people would grow beards or cut their hair, people would um, make funny faces like this. This makes identification all but impossible. In the late 19th century in Paris, the chief of police is convinced he's found a breakthrough solution. Alphonse Bétillon is keen to create an identification system for suspects and criminals that is unlike anything that preceded it. Alphonse Bertillon began taking photos of perpetrators in a really particular way. Um, his suspects had to keep really still, and those who didn't would actually be strapped down. He wanted to, in effect, document what he saw as the 11 characteristics in a very sort of specific prescribed way. The arm span, forearm length, head width and length, a foot and the digits. Very precise measurements are taken to create comprehensive criteria. Any procedure that can be objectified through standardization helps to make investigations more scientific. Indeed, the less one has to rely on soft evidence, such as witness statements or suppositions, the better. The Bertillon system is a technique to record physical characteristics. It gains traction throughout the world. A doctor in Italy at the end of the 19th century is convinced that he can discern even more from outward appearances. His name? Cesare Lombroso. According to Lombroso, criminals give themselves away through unmistakable physical characteristics, such as unibrows, flat backs of the head, long ears, prominent jaw bones, or a receding forehead. Cesare Lombroso's theories were something of a sensation at the time. He had many supporters, but of course his theories are complete nonsense. I mean, you, you're looking at me and you might not think I'm that nice, but actually I'm, I'm a good guy. Joking apart, Lombroso's theories were dangerous. They inspired racists and Nazis who referred to Lombroso's theories of supposedly biologically underdeveloped and criminal people. Despite this, photos and the precise categorization of suspects that they allow are still very important to criminologists today. 
In the USA, the infamous mugshot is an elementary part of their fight against crime. Some mugshots have even led to unexpected careers. The mugshot of Jeremy Meeks, an American gang member, gave him celebrity status. In the meantime, the allegedly most beautiful criminal in the world is a successful model. Do I find Jeremy Meeks attractive? Hell yes. Um, yeah, I mean, he's beautiful. Those eyes, that jawline, the masculinity, I mean, what's not to love? Well, Jeremy Meeks is undoubtedly attractive, but I think my wife would be very, very cross with me if I said that I found him attractive. Images are hugely important in fighting crime, and people all over the world are exposed in video surveillance. Nowhere more so than in Great Britain, as far as Europe is concerned. Estimates suggest that in Great Britain, people are being watched by some six million cameras. But such sweeping surveillance is controversial. It may help to solve crimes, but does it also have a deterrent effect? And how can we reconcile surveillance with the threat it poses to people's freedom? China is definitely the country that's pushing mass surveillance to another very critical level, where Big Brother is really watching you. The city of Chongqing, for example, has two and a half million cameras covering roughly 15 million people. That equals one camera for every six residents. Moreover, China is establishing a system that evaluates the behavior of its inhabitants in all areas of life. So-called social scoring considers an individual's attitude to payment, shopping habits, and party loyalty. More so than any other country, China is aggressively pushing the digital control of its citizens via cameras and smartphones. Technology deployed to fight crime does, however, have its pitfalls. For example, when it comes to face recognition software, Facial recognition programs are still error-prone, so some police forces work with so-called super-recognizers. Now, these are people who are able to recognize faces in a crowd even after years. And unlike recognition software, they can even recognize faces that are partly covered by hats or glasses. In fact, only about 1 or 2% of us have this ability. I'm definitely not one of them. Um, uh, I wish I was. And actually, you know, it's, it'd be amazing if you were because it would save you from that awkward moment when you see someone and say, nice to meet you, and they remind you that you actually just met a week before somewhere. It's always really excruciating. Criminologists benefit from pictures, though these can in fact be manipulated. Investigators thus need even better methods of identifying criminals. A human peculiarity that already develops in the womb promises a real breakthrough. In the late 19th century, a veterinarian at a slaughterhouse in Berlin notices that the blood-stained hands of the workers leave distinguishable marks. He develops a system to preserve fingerprints and recommends it to the Prussian government as a means of convicting criminals. But his idea is dismissed. As is often the case with revolutions, there are many who refuse to see the signs of the times, who think this can't work just because the idea is so new to them. So other pioneers have to move forward. It's the late 19th century in Argentina. Two children aged six and four are murdered. In a state of panic, their mother, Francisca Rojas, reports this to the police and she accuses an acquaintance of sexually harassing her and threatening to take away that which is dearest to her. The investigator checked the crime scene immediately and also looked for evidence that some of the other policemen of the time might have ignored. The police inspector notices a bloody thumbprint on the door at the crime scene. He saws off that section from the door because his colleague, Juan Vucetic, is working on a method to identify people by their fingerprints. Vucetic and the police inspector take the villagers' fingerprints. It turns out that the mother killed her children so she could start a new life with her lover, who didn't want children.
not only did she kill her children, but it was done in a particularly gruesome way. And the fact that a fingerprint, this new, this new sort of criminal technology, as it were, was able to link the mother to the death of her children would have been sort of profound in sort of the changing the way that people interpreted crime. This may have been the first time in history that a capital crime is solved by matching fingerprints. The significance of fingertips had in fact already been considered by others. Scientists in ancient China apparently used fingerprints as evidence as early as the 12th century. At the end of the 19th century, Edward Henry, an Englishman, elaborates the method. He classifies fingerprints according to hundreds of specific criteria, some of which are still valid today. These days, investigators lift prints with fingerprint powder and lifting tape. A digital system compares the recovered fingerprint with stored fingerprints. The FBI alone has well over 200 million fingerprints in storage. A German scanner system set a record in 2018. It can compare 3.6 billion fingerprints per second. Fingerprints are, of course, unique and have been used since the 19th century as a way of identifying where you've been and who has touched what. But they're not the only ways of doing that. Some years ago in Germany, before breaking through the front door, a burglar stood there listening to find out if the coast is clear. He leaves ear prints on the door. After he's arrested for attempted burglary, Investigators compare his ear prints with other prints on file. It proves that he is responsible for numerous other break-ins. Ear prints can be a great way to identify people. So are footprints. Of course, many criminals know how treacherous prints can be. Therefore, some try to outsmart investigators with extraordinary methods. In 2007, a Chinese woman, who had previously been expelled for visa violations, had the skin on her thumb and index fingers surgically altered in order to gain entry to Japan. She manages to re-enter the country with her changed fingertips and a forged passport. Her cover is later blown when she's arrested for another offence, and a policeman notices the strange scars. If you want to manipulate your fingertips, you must be willing to endure some hard measures because skin regenerates quickly from superficial cuts. Another problem with the fingerprints method is sometimes traces are misinterpreted, even by very experienced professionals. Madrid, 2004. Islamist terrorists commit the worst attack in Europe since World War II. 191 people are killed and around 2,000 injured. The Spanish police find fingerprints on a bag and the FBI, which is supporting the Spaniards, checks them against its database. And it looks like they have a match. The matching print belongs to an American, Brandon Mayfield, who is then jailed on suspicion of terrorism. After 15 days, Spanish forensic experts discover that the fingerprint is not Mayfield's, but belongs to an Algerian citizen. Mayfield is released from prison and receives nearly $2 million in compensation. Fingerprint identification is one of the most important weapons in a criminologist's arsenal. But this method has its weaknesses, and these are exploited by criminals time and again. Every time a new technology is found, criminals learn from that and learn how they can get past that technology in order to carry on with their crimes. And so what we need is not just people who are able to interpret forensic evidence, but also people who are able to identify and develop new techniques in order to stay one step ahead of the criminals. It's a race of good versus evil. For investigators to win this race, they need indisputable evidence. But where can they get it from?
A case in England leads to the establishment of a method that's a game changer for criminology. In 1983, a 15-year-old girl is raped and killed in Leicestershire. The police recover traces of semen and blood, but are unable to identify the perpetrator. Almost three years later, another girl is murdered in the vicinity of the first crime scene. Police arrest a mentally impaired young man, who confesses to the second murder, but denies having committed the first one. The police department, on the other hand, remains convinced that one man is responsible for both murders. Then they tried to figure out if the evidence that was left at the murder scenes, blood and semen traces, could be attributed to one person. And that's where Alec Jeffries came in. He had just recently discovered so-called DNA fingerprinting, a method of assigning DNA to individuals. Geneticist Alec Jeffries discovers that biological tissue and body fluids, such as saliva, sperm or blood, can be used to differentiate genetic characteristics. DNA, a kind of molecular ladder, and the genetic information it contains is central to this analysis. Certain parts of DNA differ from person to person. With forensic DNA analysis, specialists are able to identify and visualize these parts. It's almost impossible that two people have the same pattern. Alec Jeffries then examined both samples from the two cases. He was able to show that they were indeed from the same person, though not from the suspect. So an innocent man who had been in custody is released thanks to DNA profiling. And then a mass screening was initiated. About 5,000 local men voluntarily provide samples that are analyzed in forensic laboratories but to no avail for the time being. So even with the latest technologies, even with the most ambitious and able investigators, even with the best science, there are still cases that can baffle the experts. A few months later, in August 1987 in a pub, a woman happens to overhear a young man he boasts about getting 200 pounds from his work colleague, Colin Pitchfork, to stand in for him as a proxy while giving a DNA sample. The woman takes this information to the police. Pitchfork is apprehended and a DNA analysis done. It proves that Pitchfork is the culprit. It's the first time that DNA analysis has solved a murder case. For me, forensic DNA analysis is the most important instrument that has been developed in the past hundred years. It is absolutely invaluable, even today. Nowadays, analysts require only a tiny fragment of tissue to prepare a DNA profile. In their search for clues, experts also deploy chemicals that react with the iron in blood. This makes even the tiniest splotches of blood become visible under UV light. Crime scene units sometimes stumble upon evidence in unusual locations, as is the case in a California break-in. A man uses the toilet of the house he is robbing without flushing. Investigators then take a feces sample for DNA testing. While feces doesn't directly contain DNA, it does contain skin cells. And indeed, the DNA extracted from the feces sample belongs to a known offender. DNA analysis is not only used to convict criminals. The American organization Innocence Project is committed to exonerating those wrongly convicted through DNA testing. In the USA, more than 350 innocent people, including 21 sentenced to death, were released on the basis of subsequent DNA analysis. Some of them had even been in jail for more than a decade. Yet another reason why you can hardly overestimate the importance of DNA analysis for forensic. It was the most groundbreaking discovery. Nevertheless, DNA traces can also send investigators down the wrong track. 
In Germany, the so-called Phantom of Heilbronn keeps the police in suspense for years. An unknown female has apparently committed numerous murders, thefts and break-ins. She is in fact linked to 40 different crime scenes. Who is this phantom who leaves behind her DNA everywhere? In the end, the DNA profile was traced to a packer in the company that produces cotton swabs. The forensic geneticists had done everything right. They had accurately inferred the profile from the recovered DNA evidence, and their testing method had provided reproducible results. They finally came to the conclusion that the lab results were due to contamination, and that in future, only lab material should be used that doesn't contain the packer's DNA. Since this incident, only cotton swabs that are both sterile and guaranteed DNA-free shall be used by investigators. But DNA traces can be tricky. If you shake the hand of someone who later commits a crime, your DNA can be found at the crime scene, even though you weren't there. So even the best science is useless without smart criminologists who draw the right conclusions. Knowledge is power, and cunning criminals are always trying to get the upper hand by using perfidious methods that aren't always easy to detect. In the history of mankind, poison killings hold a special place. In ancient Rome, Emperor Claudius, or so the story goes, stands in the way of his wife Agrippina, who wants to help her son attain the throne. This son, who's from a previous marriage, would later gain infamy as Nero. So one evening, Agrippina serves her husband a mushroom dish that she prepared with poisonous toadstools. Her husband, the emperor, dies a painful death. Even today, with all our sophisticated analytical tools, it's difficult to pinpoint the cause of death to poison. One problem if someone has been murdered with poison is if experts try to analyze the blood, they can only find what they are looking for. Unfortunately, you can't just hand in a blood sample and say, oh, please list all substances. That's simply not possible. Roughly speaking, if a super special interest killer were to use a super rare ninja tree frog poison and the toxicologist had never heard of this specific poison, then they're most probably not going to find it. Some organizations seem to have particularly extensive knowledge about poisons. Well, it's a very common method, then as now, to recruit agents for a foreign intelligence organization. Secret services habitually use their special knowledge to eliminate enemies. In 1978, there was a famous case that sounded like something out of a James Bond film. Basically, it showed how sophisticated certain criminals could actually be. A man is walking across a bridge in London with his umbrella. Seemingly by accident, the man's umbrella lightly pricks a passerby. Bulgarian dissident and BBC journalist Georgi Markov. Markov doesn't know that the umbrella tip, custom made by the Bulgarian Secret Service, is poisonous. Markov was injected with a tiny pellet filled with ricin, a highly potent toxin extracted from the seeds of the castor oil plant. Georgi Markov dies. Analysts find remnants of the injected pellet during the autopsy. The poison ricin still fascinates criminals today. In 2018, large quantities of ricin were discovered in Cologne among Islamist terror suspects. 
According to experts, if used correctly, the amount of poison found would have been enough to kill more than 10,000 people. The dose makes the poison. After all, ricin is also found in the laxative castor oil, and Botox consists of botulinum toxin, potentially one of the world's most dangerous substances. Used as a biological weapon, it could kill hundreds of thousands within no time at all. Certain toxins are much in demand by the science community and pharmaceutical industry. Some of these substances are more precious than gold. A couple from the US supplies a poison that they extract by milking from thousands of scorpions and spiders that they've collected. The pharmaceutical industry will pay several thousand dollars per gram for some poisons. I have to say I'm not deeply attracted by the idea of spending my days trying to milk them for their venom. It sounds to me horrible work. And above all, it sounds to me dangerous work. And one of the reasons I became a historian is to avoid doing any of that. Arsenic is a poison that's responsible for the deaths of countless people over the centuries. Commonly used as an insecticide, this infamous powder is openly sold for decades. To murderers too. Since arsenic is odorless and tasteless, it's easy to slip it to unsuspecting victims. For a long time, it isn't possible to detect arsenic in murder victims. The breakthrough came in 1836 with the English chemist James Marsh. He developed a method with which even the tiniest amounts of arsenic could be detected. The Marsh test won worldwide acclaim and has surely reduced arsenic killings. A great invention from a great scientist. Brilliant scientists and sophisticated technology infuse the world of criminology. But occasionally, investigators need the support of some very different experts to track down a criminal. We don't know anymore whose idea it was to engage dogs to fight crime. One thing is for sure, though, it was a great idea. Dogs have an amazing sense of smell, which is down to around 220 million olfactory cells in the nasal mucosa, 40 times what humans have. Well-trained dogs are able to do genuinely amazing things. They can detect suspects um, in, in any weather and, and in any cases, almost, you know, in, in kind of no light conditions. And if a canine recognizes a criminal by a scent, that can actually now be even used in court as evidence. Cadaver dogs can pick up the scent of a body even in a thoroughly cleaned vehicle. Other dogs specialize in detecting drugs or explosives. And criminals who expect that fire and water will remove all the incriminating evidence will be taken aback by the amazing capabilities of sniffer dogs. Specially trained animals can detect even the smallest gasoline residues after a fire. Such residues provide important clues when it comes to arson. There have also been experiments with other animals, including a wild boar called Louise, who was used for a number of years in Germany in the 1980s to identify um, drugs and to track them down. Louise is no longer on duty, and wild boars only rarely discover drugs. But sometimes they do. In a Tuscan forest, wild boars recently dug up a coke stash and destroyed several thousand euros worth of drugs. The police had wiretapped drug smugglers and heard them talking about their frustration with sniffer pigs. This gave them away. But there are also much smaller, very inconspicuous animals that are truly worth their weight in gold for criminologists. Mm -hmm. 
There's a discipline of forensics called forensic entomology. So-called forensic entomologists can use the smallest insects to determine when exactly a person has died. Insects use corpses as a food source and breeding ground. Depending on their stage of development, conclusions can be drawn about the time of death. One can also detect drugs in maggots that infest corpses, and it's safe to assume that the maggots did not go and get the drugs themselves from their local dealer. Forensic entomologists can infer all kinds of things from these small animals. Sometimes, they reveal amazing secrets. The stomach contents of maggots can be analysed. I know of a case where such a procedure was used to prove paternity post-mortem. The corpse's very advanced stage of decomposition made it impossible to analyse the tissue. But the stomach contents of the maggots, which also contained corpse tissue, were still available for analysis. This made it possible to obtain the dead person's DNA profile. The knowledge of the forensic entomologists is so crucial for criminologists that so-called body farms have been established. In the US, for example, they allow scientists to study the decomposition processes of corpses in the open air. And this helps forensic scientists to better understand decomposition in a variety of environments. Having to, to deal with um, this, the, the horror of, of decomposing bodies, um, I've got a very strong sense of smell as well. I just can imagine that the whole thing um, yeah, would be very difficult, which is one more reason to admire criminologists and forensic entomologists for what they do, because these skills are so fundamentally important. Forensics is one of the most important pillars in criminology. investigators do when perpetrators strike from a great distance in the hope of leaving no relevant evidence behind. <laughs> Ballistics experts engage in the art of extracting secrets from firearms and their work is becoming ever more important because of the proliferation of deadly weapons. An insane amount of firearms is in circulation in the US, for example. Millions of firearms result in the deaths of over 30,000 people in America year for year. This, of course, also means that there are a great many cases to be solved. Ballistics experts are able to identify weapons that were used to commit crimes. Among other things, they look for specific clues. Upon being fired, a bullet rotates inside the gun barrel. This bullet will exhibit characteristic notches, a kind of fingerprint that's unique to each weapon. Ballistics experts also gain important insights from traces of gunpowder and blood. A case in Southampton in 1835 was crucial for the development of ballistics. During a burglary, a butler named Joseph Randall claims to have caught the culprit red-handed. The burglar fired a shot toward the butler and fled the scene. The experienced investigator, Henry Goddard, is asked to take charge of this case. He takes a closer look at the bullet that was fired. In those days, bullets were often molded individually by the pistol's owners. Henry Goddard became suspicious and began investigating in a kind of really unusual manner. Goddard melts down lead and fills it into the mold that the butler uses to cast his bullets. He then compares the bullet with the one found at the crime scene. 
they both exhibit the same defect. This proves the bullet was cast from the butler's mold. He had faked the burglary to fashion himself a hero and collect a reward from his employer. It was probably the first time the analysis of a bullet was the key for solving a crime. It was groundbreaking, a milestone in the history of criminalistics. Ballistics experts continue to refine and advance their methods over the decades. In the meantime, a discipline called molecular ballistics has emerged. It helps experts to uncover spectacular details. The focus of interest in molecular ballistics is so-called backspatter. When a bullet hits a biological target, blood and tiny tissue fragments are spattered back into the direction of the shooter and his gun. Pioneering molecular ballistics experts like Cornelius Kortz are keenly interested in the patterns of tissue that ends up on and in a gun. They look for DNA fragments, even in murder weapons, that are 10 years old. Scientists find out things that should worry offenders who thought they'd gotten away with their crime. Let's say a criminal who shoots someone thinks he's very clever. He might see that the gun has gotten soiled. He fires again into the ground or in the sand or in the air to clean the weapon by means of the ensuing high temperature. But does that really clean the gun? The answer is no. Even after firing additional shots, in 60 to 70% of the cases, there is still enough DNA left over in the barrel. And that, of course, forges a link to cold cases. There might be still valuable evidence in weapons from unsolved cases that have not been examined from the inside before. Molecular biologists can thus play a part in solving mysterious cold cases, also because they analyze RNA. While the DNA is identical in all cells, RNA reveals specific information on which body fluid or cell the sample comes from. So experts can find out more about the circumstances of a crime. In stabbings, for example. If a victim was stabbed with a knife, Experts would surely find the DNA of the victim on the blade, but they won't know whether the knife was used for a superficial skin cut or for a stab to the internal organs. Now, if the forensics check the tip of the blade for RNA and maybe detect liver-specific RNA, they can conclude that the knife had been used for the life-threatening stab. So the RNA can tell you more about the case and possible motives. Accidental or premeditated, natural death or murder. In tens of thousands of cases across the globe, the cause of death is unclear. How can we get to the bottom of a crime? Forensic pathologists determine whether someone died a natural death or not. Their reports often provide decisive clues. That can be seen as far back as the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries. They just used different techniques, but the questions they asked and the use of the human body as a way of answering those questions, that's as present in the 17th century as it is in the 21st. Germany in the year 1681. 15-year-old Anna Falkt is pregnant. Since the neighbors never get to see a baby, they grow suspicious that she committed infanticide, and the neighbors do in fact dig up the body of a newborn. The unmarried mother claims to have delivered a stillborn baby and buried it for fear of being shamed. Johannes Schreier, a doctor, is tasked with finding out the truth. Johannes Schreier realized that if the child had breathed outside the mother's body and therefore been killed by her after birth, then the lungs would have air in them. Whereas if the child had died before birth, 
there would be no air in the lungs. And so he took the lungs, he submerged them in water, they sank to the bottom, and they proved that the mother was not a murderer. Over the centuries, forensic medicine's importance is down to outstanding men and women not afraid to take on this demanding job. You need a certain strength of character and stability to deal with this kind of work. You're exposed to the smell and you experience what people are capable of doing to one another. You are looking into the darkest depths of humanity. Forensic scientists do everything in their power to minimize the danger posed by criminals. In some areas, however, Criminals have an edge on them. Offenders with highly specialized skills. Cyber criminals. A huge problem is that they operate on a global scale. And their field of activity is vast. Data theft, fraud, cyber stalking, malware, hacking. And then there's also the dark web. communication is traceable on the usual open internet, the dark web or dark net normally ensures that you remain anonymous. So the dark web has become a paradise for gun sellers, drug dealers, child abusers, assassins, a marketplace for cyber criminals where billions are made. Investigators have long had an eye on the virtual drug bazaar Silk Road. Revenues from the website exceed a billion dollars, according to the FBI. The FBI eventually manages to track down its operator, a physicist who purportedly collected more than $70 million in brokerage fees. In 2015, he's sentenced to life in prison. It's actually still unclear how exactly investigators detected sort of the mastermind behind the Silk Road. It would be remarkable if they had special access of the dark web. In many ways, one could argue that the dark web is not you know, bad per se in and of itself. In fact, investigative journalists use it to exchange sensitive information and also regular people who simply want real privacy when they're online. In the light of all of criminology's milestones over the centuries, it's important to define just how far investigators may go. Who will protect us from rogue investigators who abuse their power and knowledge? How can we protect the liberal rights of citizens and at the same time, advance the field of criminology? The challenges are immense. There's more international crime, more digitization, and more knowledge on both sides. It's a never-ending game of cat and mouse, but the rules of the game keep changing. Forensic scientists are absolutely fundamental to the investigation of crime, and not just serious crime, but everyday crime, and police could not do their job without them, and we would not be safe without them. Ballistics. DNA analyses, fingerprint scanning systems, forensic medicine. The advances in all these areas of criminology are immense. If we as a society acknowledge the importance of the forensic sciences, then we also need to do more. We need to encourage more research. Sophisticated technology, better analyses, the responsible use of data, assurances that our civil liberties will not be violated. Smart research. If forensics managed to take all this seriously, then millions of people worldwide would be safer.